House of the Dragon Episode 8 is set six years after the previous episode, so there are now new actors playing Rhaenyra's kids, Jace, Luke, and Joff, and Daemon's kids, Baylor and Rhaena, and Alicent's kids, Aegon, Helena, and Aemond. Alicent's family have been ruling in King's Landing, while Rhaenyra and her family have been living on Dragonstone, and Rhaenys and Baylor are on Driftmark. But now, as King Viserys and Lord Corlys both seem near death, their families come together and try to make peace before it's too late. So what happens and what does it mean? This video has no spoilers for Hot D, past episode 8. Rhaenys Targaryen has been ruling Driftmark, the Valarion Island, because her husband, Lord Corlys Valarion, has been at war on the Stepstones, fighting the Triarchy. Daemon killed the Triarchy's leader, the Crabfeeder, years ago, but this war continues. And now Corlys is wounded, and it seems that he might die. In the books, Corlys isn't wounded, he just gets sick because he's old. Corlys is now 76 years old in the books. So Corlys's brother Vaemond asks who will be the next Lord of Driftmark if Corlys dies. Corlys wants Lucerus Valarion to inherit Driftmark, because Luke is supposedly the son of Lainor Valarion. But Vaemond says that since Luke is actually Harwin Strong's bastard, Vaemond should get Driftmark instead. While Rhaenys previously said that she wants her granddaughter Bela to inherit Driftmark. So this begins a power struggle between Luke, Vaemond, and Bela to control the second most powerful house in Westeros. On Dragonstone, Daemon and Rhaenyra now have two sons named Aegon and Viserys. Daemon has settled in to married life, and just as Viserys's hobby was his model city, Daemon's hobby is collecting dragon eggs. Daemon climbs around the Dragonmont, a volcanic mountain on Dragonstone, and he finds some dragon eggs laid by Rhaenyra's dragon Cyrax. The eggs are laid in a sack that's hard on the outside and warm on the inside. It looks like the eggs in the movie Alien, and apparently this is how dragon eggs incubate in the wild. Daemon takes the eggs to put in a warming chamber. Maybe he'll give them to his new sons. Dragons are weapons, and Daemon is stockpiling eggs for future conflict. Daemon's dragon keepers have blood and burns on their faces. It looks like wrangling dragons is a dangerous job. Rhaenyra's eldest son, Jace, practices speaking Valyrian. He says that Aegon the Conqueror ordered for some trees to be felled. Because when Aegon landed on Westeros, he cleared away forest to build what would eventually become the city of King's Landing. He didn't cut down every tree, though. There's still that weirwood tree in the Red Keep, sacred to the old gods. Jace is the heir to the throne after Rhaenyra, so he studies hard and takes his responsibilities seriously. Unlike Alicent's eldest son, Aegon, who takes nothing seriously except for masturbation. We see the Painted Table, a map of Westeros that Aegon made before his conquest. Stannis and Daenerys use this same table later in Game of Thrones. Rhaenyra and Daemon learn that Vaemond wants to take Driftmark. If Luke is disinherited for being a bastard, that could weaken Jace and Rhaenyra's claims to the throne. And if Luke doesn't get Driftmark, their family won't get the Valerion's wealth and their powerful ships. So Rhaenyra and her family go back to King's Landing to defend their power. Rhaenyra doesn't get a big official welcome to the Keep. Otto specifically keeps it low key to undermine Rhaenyra and to make her seem less important. It's kind of like Viserys' welcome to Driftmark previously. Rhaenyra is greeted only by Lord Alan Caswell. We saw him previously congratulating Rhaenyra after her childbirth. House Caswell have a centaur for a sigil, and they rule Bitterbridge in the Reach. Rhaenyra and Daemon find that the Red Keep has changed while they were gone. Alicent and Otto have taken down Targaryen heraldry and covered up those dragon orgy murals and replaced them with symbols of the Faith of the Seven. The showrunners say that Alicent turns to religion to redeem herself after she attacked Rhaenyra last episode. But this is also a political move, because the Faith is closely tied to the power of House Hightower. The Faith is based in the Hightower city of Old Town. 
These religious symbols may imply disapproval of Rhaenyra's incestuous marriage with Daemon and of her bastard children. The removal of Targaryen imagery shows that the Targaryens aren't in charge here. Otto and Alicent Hightower control the throne. Rhaenyra and Daemon go to visit Viserys, and they see that Viserys's model city is now covered in cobwebs. There's even a rat on it. Viserys is so sick that he's no longer working on his passion project, and the neglected dirty city suggests that Viserys's kingdom is corrupt, his realm is disordered. The smoke amidst the city evokes the smoking ruin of Valyria after its downfall. Viserys' sickness is something like leprosy. He's in constant pain, body parts are falling off, and part of his face is now gone. Daemon has always looked to Viserys for approval and love, so he's so devastated to see his brother dying that Daemon can hardly look at Viserys. Rhaenyra shows Viserys his new grandsons, Aegon and Viserys. Baby Viserys is named after King Viserys, and Aegon is named after Aegon the Conqueror. Of course, Alicent already has a son named Aegon. The books say that Rhaenyra named her kid Aegon the same name to insult Alicent. And it also shows Rhaenyra's political ambitions. Naming her kids after King Viserys and King Aegon suggests that Rhaenyra's children are the true royal bloodline. Unlike Jace, Luke, and Joff, who are obviously Harwin's bastards because of their dark hair, Aegon and Viserys have Targaryen blonde hair. They look like true kings. And Rhaenyra is now pregnant again with her sixth child. Viserys is happy to meet his new grandkids, though the grandkids are less happy to meet him. When Viserys is overwhelmed with pain, he drinks milk of the poppy, which is basically opium, a painkiller. So Viserys is drugged out of his mind half the time, and lets Alicent and Otto run the kingdom for him. So Rhaenyra and Daemon think Viserys will be no help with the Driftmark succession issue. Alicent and Otto run a small council meeting, dealing with such thrilling issues as the taxation of wool. Viserys once said that Daemon could never be king because he'd find the actual work of government to be boring. If he had to sit at a table every day putting up with this kind of bullshit, Daemon would go mad. But Alicent and Otto have the patience and are doing the work. Though they're also scheming for their own ambitions. Alicent speaks with a Kingsguard called Eric Cargill. Eric has a twin brother called Arik, who's also a Kingsguard, and Alicent can't tell Eric and Arik apart. Also on the Kingsguard is Commander Harold Westerling, Kristen Cole, Stefan Darklin, and two others who we haven't met yet. Alicent learns that her son, Prince Aegon, raped a servant called Diana. Diana is traumatised and terrified that she'll be punished. In this world, we see many women punished or killed for having sex with the wrong person, even if they didn't choose to. A noble girl who has sex outside wedlock might be hastily married someplace, or sent away to be a sister of the faith. But lowborn girls like Diana may be considered permanently tarnished, labelled as whores or sinners. Alicent comforts Diana. Maybe she relates to Diana because Alicent experienced Viserys having sex with her when she didn't want to. But Alicent also subtly threatens Diana, and pays her so that she won't tell anyone that Aegon raped her. Alicent presents her family as the religious and virtuous royals, so she doesn't want rumours of Aegon's crimes shaming her family. And she doesn't want rumours of potential royal bastards who might become rival claimants for the throne. So on one level Alicent supports Diana, but at the same time Alicent silences Diana and protects Aegon's reputation. Rhaenyra previously said that Alicent wears a cloak of righteousness. Like her image as a righteous, virtuous woman is a fake disguise to hide her family's corruption. Alicent participates in enforcing the same patriarchal system that had trapped her. Alicent gives Diana moon tea to prevent pregnancy, like when Rhaenyra had moon tea. Melos said that moon tea can be unpleasant if brewed improperly. In the books, Lysa Tully almost dies from drinking moon tea, so hopefully Diana's okay. Alicent confronts Aegon and shouts at him for raping Diana. 
Alison seems more concerned about the political consequences of the rape than about its immorality. Alison slaps Aegon, as she did last episode. Alicent's parenting of Aegon involves a lot of shouting and hitting, and this has not made Aegon a better person. Alicent is disgusted by him, and tells Aegon, you're no son of mine. Tywin says the same thing to Tyrion in Game of Thrones, and we see in Tyrion the pain that is caused by a parent's rejection. Aegon doesn't get much love from his father Viserys either. Maybe Aegon's feelings of rejection fuel his cruel behaviour, expressing his pain by hurting others, like Tyrion in the later books. Alicent hugs Helena, who is Aegon's sister and wife. Aegon and Helena now have two young children, who we haven't seen yet, and Alicent feels terrible for Helena, being married to this useless, cheating rapist even though the Hightower's political ambitions are probably why Aegon and Helena got married in the first place. Alicent faces Rhaenyra and Daemon after long years apart. We see the scar on Rhaenyra's arm where Alicent slashed her last episode. The two sides remain prickly and passive-aggressive with each other. Rhaenyra says that Alicent and Otto are deliberately keeping Viserys weak and drugged so that they can rule in Viserys' name. But Alicent argues that Viserys needs the drugs for his pain, and that the Hightowers are just doing the right thing. Jace and Luke visit the training yard. They remember one time when Luke tried to use Kristen's Morningstar, and almost hit himself in the head. Kristen's actor says that he was more worried about hitting himself in the balls, which was, quote, not cool and not rock and roll. Luke is uncomfortable being here to claim Driftmark, knowing that he's not really Laenor Valerion's son, and that he looks like his real father, Harwin. This young man is forced to lie about his identity for the sake of his parents' politics. Jace supports his brother by saying it doesn't matter what other people think. Which sounds nice, but it's really not true. Politics is all about what people think, and if no one believes in Luke's legitimacy, he won't survive as a ruler. We see Aemond Targaryen training with Kristen Cole. The books say that with Kristen's training, Aemond became a proficient and dangerous swordsman, despite the loss of his eye. Kristen says that Aemond will win tournaments with his skill, but Aemon says he doesn't care about Tony's. Aemon only cares about real fights, real killing. Then he looks at Jace and Luke. Luke cut out Aemon's eye last episode, and Aemon wants revenge. Vaemond Valerion marches in surrounded by Valerion and Hightower heraldry. Vaemond knows that in politics, what other people think is everything. So he presents himself as the true Valerion heir, with House Hightower's support. Otto and Alicent meet with Vaemond, and Otto says there may be war soon. He means that the Triarchy on the Stepstones could become a threat to Westeros, but he also thinks that there could be war between Rhaenyra and Aegon for the throne, which is largely Otto's fault for pushing Aegon as heir. To prepare for war, the Hightowers want the support of House Valerion. So Vaemond says that if they help him inherit Driftmark, Vaemond will support the Hightowers. Once they disinherit Luke, Otto hopes to disinherit Jace and Rhaenyra, and to put his grandson Aegon on the throne. But Alicent has doubts. She's not sure if she wants to go against Corlys and Viserys' wishes. And does she really want her terrible son Aegon to be king? While the Hightowers make an alliance with Vaemond, Rhaenyra tries to ally with Rhaenys. Rhaenys is happy to see her granddaughter Rhaena, who has been living on Dragonstone with Rhaenyra and Daemon. But Rhaenys is cold to Rhaenyra. She's always been a bit hostile to Rhaenyra, maybe envious that Rhaenyra is heir to the throne when Rhaenys herself was rejected from the throne. But now Rhaenys is really mad, because she believes that Rhaenyra killed her son Laenor, and apparently Rhaenyra has just let Rhaenys believe that for the last six years. Rhaenys wears black clothes, as though she's still mourning the deaths of her children. Rhaenyra now says that she didn't kill Laenor, but she doesn't reveal that Laenor is in fact alive somewhere in the East. She wants to respect Laenor's choice to be free and anonymous. And Rhaenyra proposes an alliance. If Rhaenys supports Luke's claim to Driftmark, 
then Luke will marry Raina, and Jace will marry Baela. So when Jace becomes King of Westeros, Baela will be Queen. And when Luke becomes Lord of Driftmark, Raina will be the Lady of Driftmark. This alliance would make Rhaenys' granddaughters two of the most powerful women in Westeros. But Rhaenys has said before that she's more interested in keeping her family safe than in getting political power. If the Hightowers bring down Rhaenyra, Rhaenys doesn't want to go down with her. So Rhaenys rejects Rhaenyra's offer and says she'll stand alone. We hear thunder in the background, which evokes the storm of war that's coming and reminds us that Rhaenys' mother was Jocelyn Baratheon of Storm's End, the castle that withstands the storm. So Rhaenyra feels alone and afraid. Without allies, she can't protect her family. Rhaenyra visits Viserys and asks him to defend her. Viserys had told Rhaenyra about the prophecy of Aegon the Conqueror, that the Targaryens must be united to save the world from the White Walkers, but by making Rhaenyra his heir, then allowing Alicent and Otto to take power, Viserys has divided and weakened his family. He's failing as a king and as a father. In the morning, we see how Viserys' sickness has ravaged his body. We see the pain he's in. But today, Viserys refuses to drink the milk of the poppy drug. He wants his mind clear so that he can finally fix the political divide in his family. In the books, Viserys doesn't have this terrible leprosy disease. Viserys just has a weak heart because he's fat and drinks too much and cuts his hand on the Iron Throne. The books say that Viserys is just not that interested in politics. But in the show, Viserys has good intentions. He does care. He just makes bad mistakes and eventually gets too sick and weak. The author of the books, George Martin, says that the Viserys in Hot D is a much better and more tragic character than the Viserys in the books, so much so that George feels tempted to rewrite his books. Otto holds court as Hand of the King to decide who'll get Driftmark after Corlys. Of course, Otto has already agreed to give Driftmark to Vaymont, so this is all just empty political theatre, a cloak of righteousness. Vaemon speaks of the history of House Valerion, how they are one of the only surviving families from Old Valyria, how they've been allies of the Targaryens for centuries. Vaemon says that he has true Valerion blood, implying that Luke is a bastard and not a real Valerion. Before Otto can give Driftmark to Vaemon, King Viserys unexpectedly turns up. He walks slowly and painfully to the throne, making this huge effort to support his daughter Rhaenyra and her family. Viserys' brother Daemon helps him to his throne and puts his crown back on his head when it falls off. It wasn't in the script for Viserys' crown to fall off. That just happened accidentally and the actors went with it. It's a touching moment of love and support between brothers with a rough history. In episode 1, it was hinted that Daemon might kill Viserys to take his crown. But even after all the fights and exiles, Daemon is loyal to his brother. Viserys says that the whole Valerion succession question is already settled. Lord Corlys wants Luke to inherit Driftmark. And Rhaenys agrees. Earlier, Rhaenys had said that she wouldn't support Luke, but now she does, and she agrees to Rhaenyra's proposal to marry Luke to Rhaena and Jace to Baela. It's a pretty good compromise, really, because Rhaena and Luke's children will have Valerion blood through Rhaena's mother, Lena. So if Vaemond really just cares about the Valerion bloodline, he should be okay with Luke and Rhaena taking Driftmark. But Vaemond wants the power for himself. Viserys calls Vaemond a second son, which reminds us that Vaemond may feel frustrated that he's always been less powerful than his big brother, Lord Corlys. And Vaemond is angry about the lies, that everyone's pretending that Luke is Laenor's son when he's really Harwin's bastard. So Vaemond finally shouts the truth that Rhaenyra's sons are bastards, and he calls Rhaenyra a whore. Vaemond knows he'll be punished for this. Vaemond's actor said that Vaemond falls on his sword to tell the truth. Suddenly, Daemon kills Vaemond by slicing through his head. The cut is so clean because Daemon uses his Valyrian steel sword, Dark Sister, and Valyrian steel is super sharp. 
In the books, Vaemond's death is different. Rhaenyra orders Daemon to kill Vaemond, and then Rhaenyra feeds Vaemond's corpse to her dragon. So Rhaenyra seems more villainous in the books here. Vaemond's corpse is reassembled by the Silent Sisters. The Silent Sisters are an order of women in the Faith of the Seven who prepare the dead for the grave. They wear grey and swear vows of chastity and silence. They're called Death's Handmaidens, or the Stranger's Wives, because the Stranger is the god of death in the Faith. The sisters cover their face because it's ill fortune to look on the face of death. But Rhaenys watches as the sisters prepare the corpse of her brother-in-law. She says the stranger has visited her more times than she can count. Her daughter Lena died, her son Lenor seemingly died, and now her husband Corlys might die. And if this conflict between Rhaenyra and Alicent gets worse, many more people will die. By siding with Rhaenyra, Rhaenys has put herself and her grandkids in danger. The royal family have dinner, and the showrunners took inspiration here from the Last Supper painting by da Vinci. Rhaenyra and Alicent sit apart from each other, which contrasts with how close they were in the past. This shot is based on an illustration in the book Fire and Blood. Viserys holds this dinner to try and reunite his family before he dies. In the throne room, Viserys used his strength as a king, but now Viserys shows his vulnerability as a father and a husband. He takes off his mask to show his withered face, and urges his family to make peace for his sake as a dying old man who loves them. Rhaenyra is moved by her father's words, so Rhaenyra thanks Alicent for loving and supporting Viserys all these years. Alicent finds common ground with Rhaenyra as a mother, and says Rhaenyra will be a good queen. And that startles Otto, because his whole plan is to make Aegon king instead of Rhaenyra. But Alicent and Rhaenyra really try to reconcile, so for a moment it seems like peace is possible. But Rhaenyra and Alicent's children continue their conflict. Aegon insults Jace and his betrothed Baylor, and Helena whispers another cryptic prediction. She says, beware the beast beneath the boards. This evokes dangerous hidden forces at the Red Keep, spies and rats and secret tunnels. And metaphorically, the beast beneath the boards could be the conflict and resentment that still lurks beneath this appearance of peace. Helena gives a speech about how her marriage with Aegon isn't so bad because Aegon mostly ignores her, which is pretty dark, but it's also the longest coherent speech we've seen from Helena, so Otto is proud of his granddaughter. It turns out that even Otto is capable of being nice sometimes. Jace dances with Helena, and their goofy joy is probably the most wholesome moment all season. Remember that Rhaenyra proposed for Jace to marry Helena, so this is a bittersweet vision of what could have been if that marriage happened. Though at the same time, Jace dancing with Helena might be a subtle dig at Helena's husband Aegon, as revenge for Aegon insulting Bela. That's more how it seems in the book anyway. But the adults get along and have a good time, and for a moment it seems like there might be peace between Rhaenyra and Alicent's families. So Viserys goes to bed believing that he's done the right thing and that everything's gonna be okay. And then everything goes wrong. A servant puts a roast pig in front of Amond, and Luke laughs. Because previously Luke gave Amond a pig to bully him. So Amond is furious, and he gives a subtly insulting speech. He says Jace and Luke are strong boys, which sounds like a compliment, but really he's saying that they are Harwin Strong's bastard sons. So the boys fight until Daemon ends the scuffle with one finger. Daemon stares down Amond, and he wins the staring contest because he has twice as many eyes. It looks like Amond and Daemon would love to fight or make out or something. Amond seems to both idolise Daemon and see him as a rival. When Daemon killed Vaemond, Amond looked inspired. Rhaenyra and Alicent hold hands and try to be friends again. But these mothers have passed their conflict down to their children, and the children have not let go of the rivalry. 
The book says that just as the sins of the fathers are visited on the sons, the sins of the mothers are as well. Can Rhaenyra and Alicent undo the damage of their past conflict? We see Mazaria meet with Talia. Mazaria was Daemon's lover, and has now become a spy master. Talia is Alicent's maid in the Red Keep, and it seems that Talia is now spying for Mazaria. So what is Mazaria up to? Previously, Mazaria spied for Otto. Is Mazaria still working for Otto, or is she maybe working for Laris now? Are Mazaria's child spies listening from the secret passages in the Red Keep, and that's how Laris knows things? Or is Mazaria working for herself? Maybe she wants revenge on Daemon for him abandoning her. Viserys is dying. He's in pain, he's heavily drugged. So he speaks to Alicent, but Viserys thinks that he's speaking to Rhaenyra. He tries to continue his earlier conversation with Rhaenyra about Aegon's dream, the prophecy that the Targaryens must unite to save Westeros. Alicent doesn't know about this prophecy, but she hears Viserys say Aegon and you must do this, so Alicent thinks that Viserys wants her to make their son Aegon king. That's not what Viserys means. Viserys barely remembers that his son Aegon exists. What Viserys actually means is that Rhaenyra is the prince that was promised. That Rhaenyra is the saviour who will unite the realm and defeat the White Walkers. And we know that's not true. The White Walkers don't actually turn up until 170 years later in Game of Thrones. But this is a classic Targaryen mistake. Several generations of Targaryens have believed that they will be the heroes to save the world, but have been wrong. Rhaegar Targaryen believes himself to be the prince that was promised, but then he changes his mind and says that his son is the saviour. Aemon Targaryen, on his deathbed, says that Daenerys is the prince that was promised. Aegon the Conqueror, who started this prophecy, thought that he would be the one to beat the White Walkers. At least according to the showrunner of Hot D, that detail isn't in the books. But this is one of the dangers of prophecy. People assume that they or their children are the most important people in the world, and that often leads to disaster. Alicent now wrongly believes that Viserys' dying wish is for Aegon to be king, even though Alicent just said she supports Rhaenyra and just told Aegon that he's not her son. But maybe on some level Alicent wants to believe that her son will be king. Because Alicent and Otto have spent years building political strength for their family, and Alicent's resentment of Rhaenyra for her lies and infidelity have not gone away. So a dangerous mix of emotion, ambition, prophecy, and confusion is swirling through Alicent's mind. When it's time to decide who gets the throne, who will Alicent choose? Alicent leaves, and the king dies alone. Viserys says no more, and my love. His love is Emma, his first wife. Viserys' actor says Viserys never stops loving Emma, and sees Emma as he dies. The phrase, no more, might refer to Emma saying that she won't birth any more children. Viserys' insistence on impregnating Emma despite the health risks got Emma killed, and Viserys still feels guilty about that. No more might also mean that Viserys will feel no more pain. He has suffered so much, but now that he thinks everything will be fine, maybe Viserys welcomes death. In a way, he's been dead ever since Emma died. This whole first season of House of the Dragon has basically just been backstory. This is the prologue, the setup, the building of tension before the main event. Now that King Viserys is dead, and now that we know all these characters and their relationships, the real conflict can begin. If you want to know the full story of Hot D, you've got to check out the book Fire and Blood. There's also the main series of books, and the world book, and Dunk and Egg. You can get any one of these on audiobook for free right now at audible.com ASX. Sign up for a premium plus trial membership, and you get an audiobook to keep, even if you cancel the trial. You can get any Game of Thrones book, or Lord of the Rings, or Dune. Membership also includes unlimited access to thousands of audiobooks and shows in the Audible Plus catalogue. 
Sign up at audible.com slash ASX or text ASX to 500 500. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. We're doing a live stream each Sunday night right after Hot D, then one of these explained videos later in the week. Thank you to the patrons, including Hayden Ross, Evelyn Ng, Jake Rellis, Jeff Tobin, Auden Landoy Solly, Emma Stillman, and Nick Telecast. Cheers.